Hey, Family Church, welcome to this new series. This is Jamie Ketchum. Some of you already know her, but she's our communications director for Family Church. And over the COVID time, she did something unique. I'd never heard of it. She did a virtual marathon. So what in the world is a virtual marathon? So basically it's like a regular marathon, but instead of running with a bunch of other people, you do it on your own. So I actually started right here at Family Church in Green and I mapped out 26.2 miles plus a little extra just to make sure. <laughs> and then I ran and ended right here at Family Church Green. So this is an exciting, event obviously and you must have been preparing for that for some time yeah almost five months so so what makes you decide that you're going to devote five months of your life and incredible time and energy to running that far well i've been an athlete for as long as i can remember i played lots of sports growing up um, and i would always joke that even though i wasn't fast i could run forever and sooner or later i started thinking there's a way to prove that and that's to run a marathon. And so I decided that that was going on my bucket list and I was going to run a marathon and I was going to train and do it. And had you ever tried it before? This actually was my third attempt and my first completion. Uh, okay, there's a story there. We'll come back to that. Yes. <laughs> um, so one of the things I was intrigued about your story is you showed up thinking you were gonna run by yourself for five hours. And what was your surprise? So I um, knew that I was running a virtual marathon, which means I'm just running by myself. But my friends caught wind that, that I was going to do it and got my route from Drew and showed up at the start line with t-shirts and posters. And I thought they were just sending me off, which was really exciting um, to even get that. And they prayed over me and, and then I left uh, the parking lot and thought I was in for five hours of quiet with my worship music. And then I get up my first hill and there are a few people from my life group there with posters cheering me on. And then another couple of miles later, there was a big group of people cheering me on. And so every five miles for the 26.2, I had a cheering section. That is so amazing. That's, that's friendship. Yes. They're devoting their whole morning to sitting inside room. That is doing life together <laughs> for sure. What's the hardest part of a marathon? Um, starting about mile 20, <laughs> because one, when you're training for a marathon, 20 miles is the furthest you run. Uh. So you've really only pushed yourself to that limit. And when I hit mile 20 to about mile 23, I was done. But um, actually at mile 15, um, unplanned, my dad had gone home and grabbed his bike and he rode the last 10, a little over 10 miles with me on his bike, just cheering me on and encouraging me and reminding me that even if you have to walk, you're gonna do this, you're gonna finish. Um, so I had someone constantly there to encourage me along the way for those last 10 miles. That's amazing, that's amazing. Yeah. And so when you came back in, you finished here at the Green Campus. I did. What was it, what'd you see when you came back in? Um, well, I turned the corner and um, one, there was road construction happening that day, but it felt like everything just stopped as I came in, which was crazy. Little did I know that my mom had actually asked the construction workers to stop. Um, <laughs> stop, my you, daughter's coming through. <laughs> yes, if you knew my mom, that's a total thing she would do. But uh, also, as I came around the corner, everyone that had been there throughout the day at the different stops were all waiting in the parking lot. There were multiple finish lines planned for me. Everyone was cheering. There were multiple people taking videos and pictures, and it was hard to not be overwhelmed in those last probably 0.2 miles that I had to run, uh -huh. but it was pretty exciting. <laughs> that is an amazing finish and incredible support. Yes. That's cool. What an incredible story. What an incredible race. As we were thinking about it, we said, you know, Jamie ran alone, but she didn't run by herself. What, what a great metaphor that is, not only for life, but but for what it means to run the race that God has called us to. And in fact, that's the theme of a very important chapter of Scripture. And sometimes at Family Church, we do topical. We talk about the unstoppable church as we have been. Sometimes we do textual. All of them come from the Scripture, but the textual, we focus in a little more intently on one passage of Scripture. And this next several weeks, we're going to be in Romans chapter 12. So if you want to turn there in your Bible or open your YouVersion app and look at Romans chapter 12, one to three, and you'll see why we are talking so much about a marathon. It starts like this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, 
Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Now there's a whole lot in those few phrases and we're going to walk through that carefully. And he starts with, therefore, which means it's a link to what came before that, which is Hebrews chapter 11. And it's a huge list of people from the Old Testament that were saints, that were followers of Jesus, that were followers of God, that were incredible examples, sometimes, sometimes good examples, sometimes not good examples. And he says, since you have such a cloud of witnesses, why is it so important to how we see life? Because the way that you perceive your journey affects the way you run the race. It, it changes the way you see what happens to you and, and changes the way that you interact with other people, even in the midst of life. So let's look at what this, let's break it down into some parts. The first part is the crowd around me. And he says, you've got a crowd of witnesses. And obviously the first part is just what I said to you. It's witnesses from the past. And that passage 11, in chapter 11, he talks about from the very beginning, Abel and Enoch. And then he goes through some of the big names of scripture, uh, Abraham and Jacob and Moses. And and it talks about their faith and how in spite of the difficulties of their life or the difficulties of what God called them to, they exhibited faith. And, and it's clear from Scripture that we're supposed to look back at not the only the Old Testament, but also the, the New Testament. Uh, some of my favorite characters, the Apostle Paul and Peter and, and Barnabas and, and honestly, people like Thomas as well. Because it says that they're witnesses and I wonder, what does that mean? It, it means that they are witnesses of the goodness of God, that in spite of what they may have felt at the moment, they were trusting God and that God brought them through. It's a witness to the frailty of, of human beings. There is hardly a character in Scripture that hasn't face-planted at some point in their life. And that, that's an encouragement to me, and it, maybe that sounds a little twisted, but it, it, it's encouraging that God can work with, with people that are fallible as I am. And then it's also, a, they are witnesses to the fact that it's worth it. At the end of your life, sometimes there's only two sentences that sum up somebody's whole life. And, and what it says is, did they follow God or didn't they? Did they walk by faith or did they not? And so he, he says, as you're running your race, I want you to think of all these people like they're in the stands around you, cheering you on, knowing what the truth is and helping you to remember that. I found myself singing a, a tune the other morning as I was just worshiping and, and spending some time with the Lord. And uh, sometimes I don't even know exactly what the song is till it comes out. And, and it was an incredible song called, Oh Lord, You're Beautiful. Your face is all I seek. And, and as I thought about it, that was from a very important character in my life. Somebody that helped transform the, the faith of my parents into a personal faith by, by bringing Jesus into a more of a rock music kind of a, of a genre. And, and also he was a challenger of walking by faith and humility and trusting God. And Keith Green was a, was a key part of my journey. And, and when I hear a song by him or when I read something that he wrote, it's a reminder and a challenge of what God has done in my journey in the past and what he's done for others. And, and then I think it also is important if we realize that there is a witness crowd from the present, that if you are fortunate as I am to have deep spiritual friendships, people that you can talk to honestly about your struggles, people that you can share your heart with, people that don't just say, oh, okay, you'll be fine, but say, I'll pray for you, and they mean it. And, and people sometimes that point you to a passage of scripture or, or people that just challenge you and say, you know what? God has done this before. He will do it again. And, and I think of Jamie and the picture that she was, she was in this race. And, and, and about mile 15, her dad went home and got a bike. And he rode behind her with a sign on his back, maybe just to protect his little girl. But he was right there with her. And then at about every five miles along the journey, she had friends and family that would hold up a placard to, to tell her how far she had come. And, and I thought, you know, as I talked with a friend of mine, I said, you know, I think that's one of our of our ways that we can really encourage each other. Sometimes you need to say, man, I see, I see growth in you. When, when you talked about that situation, 
your, your, your mindset was so different than it was just a year ago. It's kind of like when you're hiking a long journey and you, you finally get up on a point where you can see back and, and you can see how much elevation you've gained and, and you can have an appreciation, not so that you can, you know, quit and sit on the sidelines and rest, but, but so you can appreciate that it's been a long journey and, and you're making progress, you're getting somewhere. And so he talks about the fact that this group around us from the distant past, from the recent past, from the people that are part of your life group or part of your friendship circle or, or you meet those friends in men's ministry or women's ministry and you begin to develop those deep spiritual friendships. And then he said, now I want you to think because of those witnesses behind you, I want you to focus your mind on the race. And, it, and he says specifically, the race marked out for you. Let's think about what it is that's ahead of us. And I said this earlier, and I want you to get it. You can write it down or not. But it says, the way we see the journey changes the way we run the race. When you hear people tell you their story, some people talk about it like life has just been a series of tragedies. There's been one thing after another, and they, they just tell you about all the pain, all the hardship, and, and not that that's not valid. But it sounds like their expectation, life was supposed to be easy, and I am so disappointed that it's not. See, it's a different when you say life is going to be a journey that's a marathon race and it's going to take toughness and endurance and I will not get through without Jesus. And when you have that mindset, it changes the way that you look at even every specific day and then also the expectations of, of what should I do in response to what happens. And so he, he says then if you're going to run this race, he says two specific things you're supposed to do to get ready. He says... I want you to throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. When Jamie was preparing for a marathon, as anybody who's preparing does, you don't get up one morning and decide to run 26 miles. Um, you prepare. For five months, she worked at that. And he says, in our race that we're running, it's not a dash. It's not a quick, fast thing. It's a long journey. He said, we need to have a mindset of getting really prepared and so he says these two things, get rid of the sin that entangles. Now, I, I don't know about you, but when I think of getting rid of sin, I'm thinking, how in the world do you do that? Sin is everywhere around me and it's everywhere within me. And the beautiful thing is that the story of Jesus and how he's given his life for us says that he delivered us, first of all, from the penalty of sin. That when I accept Christ as my savior, when I understand what he did on the cross and why he was raised from the dead, that tells me that I am forgiven, that there are all of my sin, past, present, and future, that, that I've been given all the goodness of Jesus. That's an awesome thing, but you can't believe that the gospel, the good news about Jesus, is only for something that happened in the past when you got saved. It is also, we are learning as a staff, it's for right now, that I need Jesus to rescue me every day, that there's this awareness that not only am I influenced by the sinful culture around me, there is a rebellious heart within me. There is, I've been changed and I'm a new person, but I still have an old nature. I have old habits, I have old patterns, and there's a, a rebellious heart within me that I need to be rescued from every day. And so in order to get rid of the sin that entangles you, you got to name it as sin and you got to be honest. And, and some sins are pretty obvious. The, the open temptation to, to steal or to lust or to lie or to, to somehow, you know, say something that isn't true about yourself to brag. But there's a lot more subtle temptations. The temptation to exalt yourself and to be proud and to be bitter. And there's all kinds of subtle things. And the Holy Spirit has to come along and reveal those to us and say, this is sin. And, and then we can confess it and God then, then can help us get out of the power of that sin. So we were freed from the sin in the past and the, the penalty of sin. We are in a battle today for the, the process of dealing with the power of sin in our lives. And someday we're going to be at the place where we are free from the presence of sin. We are completely out of this broken and messed up world. So he says, your mindset about running the race is sin hinders the race. You've got to get rid of that. Keep getting rid of it. But then he goes on and he says, there's another category. 
He says, I want you to get rid of everything that hinders. So this is an important point, and I don't know of another passage of Scripture that really deals with this, that clearly sin hinders the, the Spirit's work in my life. Sin will ruin my reputation if I let it. Through. Sin is an active thing that I know I need to battle. But then he says there's another category. There are things that are not sin that you need to also get rid of if you're going to run the race well. So if there, there are when people run marathons, I don't know if you've noticed this, but some people dress up in costumes, sometimes even heavy and furry costumes, sometimes because they're trying to make a point and sometimes just because they're being silly. But can you imagine trying to run 26.2 miles in a heavy costume? I mean, marathoners, when they are ready to run, they try to trim their weight and even the clothes that they wear are the lightest possible and the shoes are light and they want to they want to slim down everything so that they can run the best race possible. And that's what he's saying. So what does that mean for you? Let me ask you this question. Too often we come at things and we say, what's wrong with that? Let me give you an example. So when I open my iPad in the morning, I, I generally sit down with a cup of coffee and I open up. I am on a year-long process of reading through the Bible in chronological order. And so I start there most of the time. There's a little notice that comes up and it says, often opened on awakening and my news app is there and my Bible app is there. And let me tell you, when I push the news app first and it gives you the five things you need to know for the day and usually it's a ton of bad news, that changes the way I see the day. It changes my mindset. It's not the same as when I open up the scripture. And even tough places to read in scripture, I see obedient people that honor God and make it worth it. And I see disobedient people that blow their lives up and it's not worth it. And God uses that to focus my life for the day. So not... Reading a news app, getting involved too much in uh, all of the social media and all the things that distract us, those are not wrong. Watching too much TV, eating too much food, the things that we often place in as a substitute for our heart being centered on Christ, they're not necessarily sin, but they may be not helping us in our race. So here, let me give you this question. Instead of saying, what's wrong with it? Can I get away with it? How much can I tolerate and still be a Christian? What if the question was, does this help me? Does this fuel my spiritual, my spiritual energy so I can run well? Does it open my heart and my mind? And sometimes I've caught myself just doing, watching stupid little videos or something, and, and it wasn't wrong. It just took an hour of my time that I'll never get back. And so he wants us to ask the question, does this help me run the race the best way possible? When I get to the end of my life, will this be something that I said that was worth it? So that's the first question I want you to evaluate. Is are there sins that you need to set aside? Things that you know are slowing you down or keeping you from, from going full out for Jesus? And even more closely to ask the question, are there things that just I'm holding on to but I'm trying to run a race hanging on to weights and I need to let them go. And let the Spirit of God kind of probe your heart and say, there's one right there. Because this is a very individual thing. And then he says, I want you not only to get rid of the things that hinder and the sin that so easily entangles, but I want you to run with, ray, with, with perseverance, the race, and it says, the race marked out for you. Perseverance means that I have the mindset that this is going to be a long haul that this is going to be something that takes endurance and spiritual toughness, if you will. Maybe, maybe another way to ask it is, what does it take to stop you? You know, what does it take to stop you from, from connecting with other believers and uh, coming to church, reading your scriptures, talking to God, worshiping? Sometimes it's just a bad attitude or a little disappointment with God. And so he says, I want you to run with the mindset of perseverance. And I don't know if you've noticed this, but in a trip, if you think you have to drive to Eugene, man, it seems like it takes a long time. If you're driving to Alaska, <laughs> Eugene is like just getting your car warmed up because you know you got a long ways to go. And if you look at your life as seasons and there's stages and there's all kinds of changes, 
But if you get the whole picture of how God wants you to run, and then he says, I want you to do it on the race marked out before you. Now, some of you have been looking at this road that we have in our graphic, and it's like, man, I wish my life was like that. It's nice and straight. It's downhill. Uh, you can see the distance. But what if your life run is more like this? What if you're thinking, man, it is back and forth and all over the place, and mostly it's uphill, and it just feels like my life has never been clear and straight and easy. And some people, the race is beautiful. You've experienced a lot of great fellowship with people, and you've had a lot of blessings in your life of finances and relationships. And there's, there's a season that's at least that part of your life is, is easy and it's beautiful. Psalm 23, David says, sometimes my path is by green pastures and still waters. That's, that's the good stuff. He said, sometimes it's through the valley of the shadow of death. Sometimes your, your path is scary, treacherous, cliff on one side. You feel like, I don't know if I'm going to make it. And as I was thinking through this, I thought, you know, sometimes your path looks like this. <laughs> you can only see about 20 yards ahead of you. You don't know where you're going, what you're doing. You don't, you don't know for this stage of the journey what you're supposed to do. And maybe you don't even know where God is in this. So, so think about it for just a moment, would you? Think about what is my race like right now? For some of you, it's real clear. You've dealt with a lot of strategy, tragedies. You're under a lot of stress. There's a lot of just pain in your life right now. And, and you're on a, <laughs> a narrow and stony and steep path. For, for some of you, you say, well, actually, my, my race is pretty good right now. For some, you say, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And for some, it's clear what you're supposed to do, but it still just seems like it's going forever. And the good news about this passage is, is he says, I want you not only to have the right mindset of it, he said, I want you to know who you're running with. And so he goes right on and he says, I need to learn to endure, but which that means fixing my eyes on Jesus despite the difficulties of my race. This is so important because we've been talking about toughness and hanging in there and perseverance and the long race. And, and I don't know about you, but I so quickly switch to, ah, oh, I've got to do it myself and I've got to try harder and I've got to, you know, if I fail, I've got to kind of knock myself up beside the head. And, and listen carefully, you cannot run the race by yourself. Yes, you have a unique and specific path marked out for you that is like nobody else's. You ever think about that? Your race to glorify God with your life is unique in all of history. Nobody else has exactly the same combination of ups and downs and turns and confusions and pain and, and joys and blessing. So, so think about this. I can't run this by myself. I, I'm responsible to run the race marked out for me. But he says, I want you to then learn the next secret of this, and that is the champion that we focus on. How do I have the power to endure? How do I hang in there when it seems impossible? How do I stay on course? And he says, this is really simple. He says, fixing our eyes on Jesus. So he talks about our perseverance. And the very next line says, you can't do it yourself, clearly. You need to be focused on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning at shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Your focus can't be on the fog in front of you or the steepness of the path or the, the pain in your life. That's the tendency we have is to focus on those things. He said, I want you to get your eyes fixed. <laughs> I like that phrase. It's, it's not what it means that our eyes are broken and we need to get them fixed. But boy, that's a great metaphor. Well, I tell you, it's so easy for me to look at the wrong things and to be distracted. That's one of the most dangerous parts of a race. When you, when you take your eye off the path and, and you get distracted and you stumble and you fall or you miss the path. And so he says, I want us to focus our eyes on Jesus. Not once, but again and again. It's an active, keep on focusing. And then notice this. He says, you, you focus on Jesus who for the joy set before him. How did Jesus endure? How did he go through the, 
the incredible misunderstandings of everyone around him. Nobody got him. In fact, some people were trying to kill him for much of his ministry life. And he went through the, the cross and the pain and the, the suffering that that had involved and the, even the being separated from God, the Father. And it says, consider him who endured such oppositions so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You see, the reason we have to have our eyes fixed on Jesus, the reason we're running with our hand in his, so that it, Paul, Paul has a great phrase in one of his letters. He says, I strive with all Christ's power that works in me. And there's this beautiful connection between I have to be obedient and willing and say, God, this is the race I want to run. And at the same time, I have to be humble and dependent and to say, I can't even do a half day of this. That I need Jesus and I need him to fill me. I need him to rescue me from the sin of my life. I need him to give me the, the comfort and the encouragement. I need the peace that he offers. And I need the whisper of the Holy Spirit saying, here's go here and go here and don't go here. You see, I, I am required to be obedient, but the obedience is because Christ in me gives me power. And then he says, in order that you don't grow weary and lose heart, that you don't get so focused on other things that you lose heart. That's the danger, isn't it? That we, that we, instead of looking at Christ, instead of clearly knowing where we need to go, instead of having his power around us, we get discouraged, we get distracted, and finally we lose heart. We, we lose our energy, we lose our drive. Why? Because, because we've gotten our eyes off of Jesus. And he says that's the, the key part. And then he says also, in keeping your heart steady, learn the same technique that Jesus used. He says he was able to go through the cross and the spitting and the beard tearing out and the hateful attitudes and, <laughs> and the misunderstanding of the people who said they were his closest friends. How did, how did he do that? He had his eye on the fact that there was a joy set before him that once he had given his life, people would come into a relationship with God forever. We were his joy. And you see, the deepest question when you get to a place where you feel like quitting is, is it worth it? Is it worth it? It seems painful and difficult and, and it seems more than I can do. I feel overwhelmed. I don't know if you feel that, but I'm in a stretch of my life where I feel overwhelmed often. And, and the question is, is it worth it? Is it worth it to keep focused and keep stepping forward and keep running the race? And you know, it's interesting as we go back to the metaphor of the race that Jamie ran, she, she had not only friends that started her off and friends that were there with her along the journey, she had friends that came back to the green campus and they set up a, a ticker tape parade for one. They, they set up a finish line and then she comes running through there and, and they gather around her and they celebrate with her and they're excited about what God has allowed her to do in this run. And you see the joy on her face and she had tried to do a, a marathon twice before and had failed. And now she was there. And, and maybe when you look at that picture, you think, man, I wish I felt like that. That's not my story at all. Let me tell you, we are running a race and it has an end. Let me tell you a story. There, there was a couple that had been a missionary couple in Africa for a bunch of years. And they hadn't seen a lot of fruit and they'd endured a lot of hardship and now they were retiring. And so they were riding this big steamer across the Atlantic back to New York. And on the same ship, Teddy Roosevelt had also been to Africa and he had been big game hunting and he had all the celebrities and the, the hangers on around him. And when they pulled into the harbor in New York, of course, there was a big band there. This is the president and he's come home and and Teddy Roosevelt goes down the ramp, and of course, everybody's congratulating him, and he's telling his stories, and this whole huge crowd of, you know, people that were excited about that moved off, and, and then this older missionary couple come walking down the gangplank, and there was nobody there to meet him. There was somebody supposed to meet him, and they had their battered suitcases. They looked at that whole crowd, and, and the husband said, this is not fair. We gave our life in Africa so that people could hear about Jesus. And we, we endured despite so much difficulty. And, and 
he goes to shoot a few animals and comes home and he gets a celebration parade. And, and the husband was actually just really struggling with his own spirit and he, he was losing heart. And his wife said, I, I want to encourage you, just go into the bedroom, just tell God what you're feeling, just be honest with him. And he went into the bedroom and he says, God, this isn't fair. This isn't right. Doesn't seem like it's worth it. And he came out half hour later and his face was no longer cast in a, a look of anguish. And his wife said, you look better. How are you? He said, I'm good. She said, what did, what, what did God say to you? And he said, you know what God whispered to me? He whispered, you're not home yet. We have a home and it's not New York. It's heaven. And when you get to heaven, when you are there, not only will you be celebrating with all of the saints who are witnesses of your race, but you will be there with Jesus himself. There will be such a celebration and worship when we are finally done with this broken world and the pain and the, the suffering that's here. And then stand before the Lord and he'll say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. That's when you're home. You see, we often run the race like it's, a, like it's a short dash. Like I'm just trying to get the kids raised. I'm just trying to get to the point where we get married. I'm just trying to get to where I can get the next job. And we think of our race in tiny little segments instead of thinking of that day when we're going to be finally at rest. And 70 or 80 years is not very long. And we're going to be finally at rest. And the Lord will say, look at what you did. Look at what I did in your life. In fact, Corinthians talks about we, we put all of our works before him, not for salvation, but for what we did because of, because of Jesus. And some of them are wood, hay, and stubble, and they're going to be burned up, and they're gone. They, they were worthless. They don't last. But there's some that are gold and silver and precious stones, and they are lasting forever. And the scripture talks again and again about the rewards in heaven and seeing Jesus' face and, and being finally there together where we were meant to be. And I want to encourage you, dear friends, wherever you are in this journey, wherever, what stage of the race you're at, what, what thing that is causing you to feel like you should quit, think about the joy. Think about your joy when you get there. Think about the Father's joy when he sees what he was able to do in your life because you surrendered to him. When he saw that you endured because endurance shows God that we love him and that we are learning how to let him live through us. So I hope this is a challenge and encouragement for your life wherever you are. And I'm going to let the campus pastors just kind of drill down on this and help you think through what do I need to learn out of this, this passage, this scripture, this image of our life. God bless you.